Hi, my name is Terry. 2020 has been a heck of a year for so many people, and it seems like Satan's just running wild. A lot of times he's up here in our own head. So tonight, I'm going to expose him. I'm going to get real with you. I'm going to be vulnerable with you. You're welcome. And I'm going to tell you of a time when I was in my darkest abyss and how I got out of it. The presentation's an hour long. I beg you to stay till the end. There's really good stuff that I want you to hear at the end. But there's stuff at the beginning I have to put in there because I need you to hear. This wasn't designed by me. Uh, about a year ago, at like 3 in the morning, I get woken up and my buddy, the Holy Ghost, says, Hey, here it is from start to finish. The music, everything. Do this. And I said, I'm not a priest. I'm not a bishop. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a professor or a doctor. Choose someone else. Well, he kept bugging me every few months throughout the year. So I finally did it. And here it is. Watch till the very end. And if you do, I'm pretty sure that by the very end, you'll be glad you watched. It was right here on my parents' basement floor many years ago where I found myself in the darkest abyss that I had ever been in. Someone who I thought loved me had crushed my soul once again. And I found myself at my parents' house, sleeping in this bed. I felt like I was gonna vomit, so I started to walk towards the, the bathroom, and I fell down, and I found myself in a fetal position right here, absolutely helpless. My heart felt like there were a dozen jagged swords piercing it. My stomach was turning very violently, and making me nauseous. My fists and my core and every part of my body was just tense. I was hyperventilating. I was having a panic attack. I couldn't breathe. And the worst was my mind. The images that were put in there of these horrific things that hurt me over and over again on replay. I couldn't get rid of them. No matter how hard I tried, I just felt like I was dying. And to be quite honest, I kind of wanted to. Probably about an hour went by and I was still in this hell, laying on the floor, snot coming down my nose, tears coming down my face. I was hopeless and helpless. I had always been taught that Satan is real. But on that night on this floor, I knew he was, for I felt him. His presence was in this room. Tonight, I'm gonna to tell you of a true story, a story that happened to me. And I'm gonna tell you a couple lessons I learned from this story. But first, I wanna tell you about one of my best friends of all time. His name's the Holy Ghost, and he is the third member of the Godhead. And his main purpose in this life is to testify of truth whenever that truth is presented. He will do this with a blend of inspired thoughts accompanied by undeniable feelings. At least that's what he does for me. I could talk about my best friend for a whole devotional and not even scratch the surface. But I will say this tonight, that the Holy Ghost acts as a radio tower. He's giving off truth, love, light, inspiration to everyone. But it's up to the individual to be tuned in on the right station to hear what he is saying. It's like if you were driving down the freeway and you look around and everyone else is jamming out to Limelight by Rush and their air guitar and their air drumming on their steering wheel and you're like, what's the deal? And all you hear is static because the rest of the cars around you are tuned in to the radio station and you bump your dial and you're just a couple clicks away and you're listening to static. Doesn't mean that the greatest rock group Rush isn't playing one of the greatest songs, Limelight, to the universe. It means you're not connected to it. Um, I remember my sister Tammy once, I, I was when we were younger, we were in church. And I look over and, and the, I don't know what the speaker's talking about because I wasn't paying attention, but my sister was crying and it was touching her. And I kind of looked over and I'm like, what's up, baby? <laughs> you know, and, and I, I didn't understand 
But years later, I understand that that speaker was probably saying something of truth. And my sister was in tune and it was rocking her world. Where I was just thinking about sports or girls or whatever I was thinking. So we need to be in tune to the Holy Ghost to hear him. So tonight, I have asked my Heavenly Father for the Holy Ghost to be here. I know what I'm going to be talking about is true. And if you're in tune and not distracted on your phones or whatever else, um, I'm pretty convinced you'll hear and you, then you can know for yourself that what I'm saying is true. The first thing that I want to talk to you about tonight and bear you my testimony is that I know Satan lives. I felt him on this floor. I felt him so many other times in my life and I know he lives. So we're going to take a few minutes and talk about the devil and how he affects us. He is as real as you or I. This narcissist in the pre-earth life came up with a plan and presented it to Father that said, they'll behave or else. He wanted to take away our agency and he wanted all the glory for himself. Luckily, there was another plan presented. Jesus stood and said, Father, how about this plan? We'll have these people go down They'll have earth life experiences. They'll learn from their mistakes. They, they'll be love, there'll be repentance, there'll be peace, there'll be forgiveness, and I'll go down, and anything that they're short, I'll make up, and they'll come back to you, and all the glory will be for you, Father. Well, we all jumped on that plan. We thought that was a better plan. Except one third of our brothers and sisters up there decided to go with old scratch. They'll never get a body, They'll never have this earth life experience and they are very mad and they are very angry that we chose the right plan. Satan doesn't have to follow any rules. He can lie. He can omit the rest of the story. He can make stuff up and he can be anno as annoying as he <laughs> wants to be. And because he doesn't have a physical body, we can't see him with our mortal eyes. But he's always there whispering, lurking and prowling. The following story has always stuck with me ever since I watched it, and it's a very good visual of what a sly fox he is, or should I say, cheetah. Cheetahs are predators that sneak up on their prey and sprint a short distance to chase and attack. Susan and I spent almost two hours watching two cheetahs stalking a large group of topis, Africa's most common and widespread antelopes. The tall, dry grass of the African savanna was golden brown and almost totally obscured the predators as they pursued a group of topis. The cheetahs were separated from each other by approximately 100 yards, but worked in tandem. While one cheetah sat upright in the grass and did not move, the other cheetah crouched low to the ground and slowly crept closer to the unsuspecting topis. Then the cheetah that had been sitting upright disappeared in the grass at exactly the same moment that the other cheetah sat upright. This alternating pattern of one cheetah crouching low and creeping forward while the other cheetah sat upright in the grass continued for a long time. The stealthy subtlety of the strategy was intended to distract and deceive the topis and thereby divert their attention away from the approaching danger. Patiently and steadily, the two cheetahs worked as a team to secure their next meal. Tonight, I'm not gonna talk about Satan's temptations or sins or that sort of stuff. I'm gonna concentrate more on what I feel is even the more destructive part of Satan. And that is his whisperings to us when we are broken. On that night, many years ago, when I was on this floor, curled up in a fetal position and broken, that is when the devil jumped from his tall grass and pounced on me and made me think maybe the world would be better off without me. I look back now and I think, that's crazy. How could I have those thoughts? I love life. I wake up every day and try to make life epic. But you see, it wasn't me placing those thoughts in my mind. The number one trick Satan uses is he doesn't want us to know that he's even real. 
that he's the one whispering all these negative things into our mind. He's a master at using words. He never pops in a thought in your mind all nonchalant. Each word, each phrase is studied out and very carefully placed inside your mind. He knows if he whispers, you're not good enough, that you'll actually be able to figure out where that source came from because you can sit there and go, wait, you're not good enough. That means someone's saying you're not good enough. So he will literally handcraft the sentence and he'll whisper, I'm not good enough. And then you'll hear that and you'll repeat it and you'll repeat it and you'll think you're actually not good enough. You'll actually think you're the one thinking these thoughts and that you literally aren't good enough. Then he will just sit back and watch us slouch our shoulders, get sad and fall into depression and hate ourselves. It's a trick he uses on all of us. In the scriptures, Moses once said, and he beheld Satan and he had a great chain in his hand and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness. And he looked up and he laughed and his angels rejoiced. I love that scripture. I'm a very visual man and I wish I was a better artist because I've always wanted to paint that. Showing Satan with a big long chain going into the universe and him just laughing at us with all his angels. I wanted to put that on my wall to remind me who I'm fighting against, who's there. You see, if Satan can win the thought battle, he can enslave us. But we mustn't listen to the devil because we are children of a God. We are royal ancestry. You see, we have divine deity in our DNA. Our spirits are not of this earth. We are made from celestial matter. God is our father. We are created, built, designed to have love, light, positivity, faith running through us. There's no way that if Lucy, that's short for Lucifer, I sometimes like to call him a girl. <laughs> but anyway, if, if Lucifer wasn't in our mind, there's no possible way we would say things like, I'm not good enough, I'm fat, I'm stupid because we weren't built that way. There was another time about a year, year and a half ago after my divorce, where I had lost everything, both jobs. The girls I dated were <laughs> not treating me the greatest. Uh, just everything was crashing in on me. I felt lonely and I started to listen to those thoughts that he put in there. And I, wasn't, I was too broken and weak to fight him, right? And so I just, I just went with it. And, and these things just started going. And I started thinking, and at 2 a.m., I was on the freeway, I looked around to make sure no one else was there, but I started getting these thoughts of, your kids would be better off with your life insurance money. No one wants you, you're worthless. And I was too broken weak to, to fight that. I couldn't see Satan in that whole scenario. I slumped my shoulders. I regurgitated a few times until finally I said, yeah, let's do this. So I got my car, my Dodge Charger up to about 100, 120 miles an hour, somewhere in there. I don't know. I took off my seatbelt, I grabbed the wheel, and I was gonna pull a hard left. And uh, so I thought, do the world a favor, right? That's what, I was, that's what was placed in my mind. I don't know if it was the Holy Ghost or just me being a coward. But right when I was about to do it, I started feeling some adrenaline. And all of a sudden, I just heard or felt slow down. And I did. And I drove home with my hands on 10 and 2, shaking, going about 45 the whole rest of the way. I turned on some church music to try to get Satan out of there. I've actually had a few times in my life where I've been so depressed, I didn't want to go on. Now, before you fidget in your seats, because I'm talking about suicide, trust me and follow me, see where this goes. I don't really believe in talking about fluffy subjects. What's the point? 2020 has been an 
crazy year. Anxiety, depression, craziness. There's people that, that reach out towards me that are my heroes. And I'm like, wait, if you're having depression, if you're having a bad day, wow. So I really feel that fluffy subjects, someone else can do those. I'm going to tell you what's real and what's going on. In my opinion, we're in the last days of this earth, and it's only going to get tougher. Satan and his little minions are in our ears bugging us, and I can't be the only one that he's saying, you're not good enough. You should just, I don't know, leave this earth. I want you to know you're, you're normal, and it's nothing you've, you're doing. It's something that Satan's doing to everybody. So I want you to know you're not alone if you're feeling these thoughts. Knowledge is power. And the more you can see Satan and his tricks and what he's doing and why you're thinking these thoughts, the more light and knowledge and power you will have and you can combat him. I have my bad days just like everyone else. I just told you about two of them. But I'm getting a little bit better at seeing Satan's tricks. You see, when I see myself, my physical self slumped over, my head down, or my eyebrow, or you know, my fist and teeth clenched, I say to myself, Terry, stop. What are you thinking about right now? Maybe it's like, well, I'm not good enough or whatever. Or this girl, you know, won't text me back, so obviously I'm a loser. Whatever, whatever it is. And I say, Terry, is what that thought in your mind, is that from the Savior or from the devil? Well, it's the devil. I mean, yeah. And then I can talk my way out of it. I can, I can pull my shoulders back. I can pull out of that depression. You can actually, unless it's like a chemical imbalance uh, depression, I, that's different. But you can talk your way out of a, a lot of amazing things. You really can. Your mind's a powerful thing. You can say, oh, it's raining today. Sweet, our reservoirs are going to be filled up and our tomatoes will grow and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, life, it's raining. Or you can go, it's raining today. Oh, my car got washed yesterday. You can do that. Everything that comes in your mind, you can take positive or negative. Your mind and your, your thoughts control your mind. Your mind controls your actions and your actions controls your life. So that's why Satan is so hell-bent on, on telling you things in your mind that are false. And we need to combat that and see the truth. We also need to share that truth. I'll be honest, when I was first inspired to do this thing, the first thing that Satan popped in my head, the very first thing was, you keep, you're going to do it? Who are you? You know what I mean? Like, Wow, you're going to go and invite people to your own fireside? What, are you a narcissist? What, you just like to hear yourself talk? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, so that's why it took a year to actually do this. Because I was like, oh, yeah, who am I to do this? But you know what? I've been on the single scene for, well, going on two years now. And I can't tell you how many hurting souls are out there. How many people that don't think they're lovable? How many people that don't think they're good enough? And I just, I get people all the time that contact me and be like, Terry, you know, I just need your positivity today. You know what I mean? Like, help me. And I'm like, just what? You're awesome. Why are you sad? Like, but they, maybe they don't know that those are Satan. Satan's throwing those thoughts in there. It's sad. I work, I've worked with troubled youth for 20 years and I can't tell you how many people, how many of these kids I've seen cut themselves, blood going everywhere. I've had to like put my hands on people's blood bleeding wrists because they just cut themselves because they, they think they're worthless. They think they're not good enough. They think, oh, who am I? Let's just end my life. I can't tell you how many times I've had a be sitting right there by a kid because if I left even a foot, he would just start smashing his head into the ground to try to hurt himself or kill himself. And I'd, I'd have to grab his head. I remember, I still remember the, the girl's face that I, when I busted down the, the door when she was in the shower, she wasn't showering. She was hanging herself with her shoelaces. She was turning purple. 
I still remember that. And I think this is a daughter of God. She can do anything she wants in this life. And because of that idiot Satan saying that she's no good, she's up there hanging. We humans are funny. We don't want to get vulnerable. We don't want to talk about th certain things, especially our weaknesses. We feel that if we come and talk to someone and say, hey, I don't, I don't literally even want to live anymore, that we'll be labeled suicidal and crazy for the rest of our lives because we had one bad day where we were too weak to filter out Satan's crap. The world says, be tough, be strong, don't cry. Especially my generation. In my generation, there were not 12th place trophies, okay? You know, if, if I fell down and skinned my knee and blood's going everywhere, my dad said, well, hope you learned your lesson. Get up, rub some dirt on it, let's go. You know, I drank straight from the hose. I didn't even put on a seatbelt. Seatbelt, what were those? Like, my generation, we, we were programmed to be tough and not talk about certain things. So to anyone under the sound of my voice right here, right now, if you're feeling I'm not good enough, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm stupid, the world would be better off without me, please listen to me right now. That is Satan. That is not you. Stop listening to his lies. And anytime there's a negative thought in your head, that is from him. And I give you permission to tell him to go to hell because that's where he's going anyway. He's just jealous because he'll never get a body. So he talks crap about ours. But don't worry, even your little flaws, you're all, it's in the resurrection, we're all gonna be supermodels. We're all gonna be tens. So don't worry about it. Don't stress about it. Look at all the rose petals you have and, and, and forget about the couple little thorns. It makes us humble. I remember I used to get so self-conscious about my chicken legs. Again, I didn't say I had chicken legs. He did, and I believed him. And then one day I just realized, you know what? These little chicken legs, they do more service and more help for people than probably 10 bodybuilders at the gym. So just love yourselves because you're awesome. So we've discussed how Satan will go directly to your thoughts but he will also use others to do his dirty work and to get to you. Many times has this mouth been used as a tool for Satan. If I've ever offended any of you, I apologize. I haven't always known about this little trick Satan does, and I regurgitated a lot of things that he put into my mind to say to you. Satan knows all of our our insecurities and our triggers and he he knows exactly the perfect thing that will drive the wedge in between two amazing people in a relationship so please be aware of this trick from satan and filter what you say a little bit more because you might just be being used as a pawn for satan to hurt that person so before you say something to someone always ask yourself is this going to help and bless them or hurt and depress them also, if you're on the other end of that stick and someone says something mean to you, please stop and think and realize that maybe they were being used as a tool for Satan and try not to get so offended. Let's get back in to the second half of this fireside. So there I was on the floor in pain, not knowing what to do. Finally, I just said, I just got to pray like I've never prayed before. And so through snot coming down my face and tears blurring up my vision, I laid there and I could only muster up a two word prayer. That's all I could do. And that two word prayer was father. Please. And then I didn't know what else to say. I didn't know what I wanted. You see, the thing I was, the trial that I was going through was so complex. It just seemed like there was no easy way out no matter where I went. So I just addressed him and begged him. And I hoped that he would just know what I wanted and fill in the rest. 
So I just kept saying that prayer. Father, please. Over and over and over and over again. About an hour went by and I was just, my anxiety was <laughs> just going at an all-time high. My blood pressure, I'm sure, was through the roof. Um, and I just, I don't know. I, a part of me thought I'm gonna, you know, have an aneurysm or something if, I, if something doesn't happen soon. And the thing about our Heavenly Father and Jesus and the Holy Ghost, they, they give us trials, they, they let us feel some pain, but they'll never ever take it past what you can endure. After about an hour, hour and a half of just lying there on that floor, I said it one last time, Father, please. Everything all at once just went away. The thoughts I was having turned into, it's weird, but I'm a weird guy. It, it turned into, I was, I was thinking of space, just nothing, just space and stars and just, I don't know, a calm sp space. My, 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 my body that was all tense just relaxed. My heavy breathing sighed one last time and I was like, chill, just chill. My heart was swollen with just warmth and love and it was like I had a heavenly hug. It was like Jesus or the Holy Ghost or my own Heavenly Father came into that room and spooned me. They just held me and I was just warm. Anxiety went away and I knew everything was be okay. I knew I was loved. I knew I was a child of God. I knew that this trial would pass. I knew I would succeed in life after this trial. And I knew everything would be okay. I was in pure calm, being cradled like a little baby. And I fell fast asleep. I woke up probably an hour or so later, still just calm, feeling love. So I, I got up and I went to the bathroom. And I stopped and I looked in the mirror I found myself getting right next, right next to the, the mirror. And I stared at my own eyeballs. And I looked and I saw the pattern of those eyes and realized no one else has those exact eye patterns. I saw the color. Then I started thinking about how amazing the eye is and how we actually see things upside down and then our brain and everything flips it and, and, and what a miracle the eye is. Then I thought about the 60,000 miles of blood vessels that we have running through our body and how I've never, I've been on this earth life over four decades, I've never had a blood clot. Four decades, it just runs right. If something comes at my eye, I blink, I don't think about it, it just does. The, I am a miracle. I am awesome. And it made my little trial so little. If you have not stared at your eyeballs in the mirror, please do. Clear your mind of everything and just look into your soul. There is a universe in there. Go explore it. It wasn't in a mountain with a burning bush. It was on my parents' basement floor and looking into a, a mirror in a bathroom that I've, I realized I am awesome. I'm enough, I'm valuable. Heck, I'm the son of a king. My heavenly father, my real father is a God. Yeah, I mean, Satan, he can bruise my heel from time to time, but with, with Jesus, I can just crush his head. My heavenly father sent Jesus Christ so that on my worst nights, when Satan's in there pounding me, that the Holy Ghost and my Savior can come to me and tell me my true identity. That was a very, very fun experience. Hours earlier, I wanted to kill myself. Jesus and the Holy Ghost, someone came from that Godhead. 
an angel, I don't know who, someone came, took the pain away. And now I'm like Bob Marley on a beach, walking a nice warm summer day. Who says you need drugs to get high? I prefer the Holy Ghost high, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, I've had big experiences like that before and since, but those are rare. Those are like big logs in my <laughs> fire of testimony. But how I know my Savior lives, how I know my Heavenly Father loves me and has a plan is the daily flickers. It's not a big log all the time. It's the little flickers, the little things I choose to notice around me that I realize God does live. I'm not some particle from a Big Bang Theory. I'm not a slug that turned into a salamander, that turned into an ape, that turned into me. No, I'm a child of God. And it's the little flickers. So don't always expect the big ones. But on that night, for whatever reason, I was given a nice big log in my fire testimony. And I can honestly tell you, this experience happened. I was washed by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and he took away that pain. And I also realized on that night that the atonement's not just about your sins. You know, growing up, hey, Jesus died for your sins. The atonement, he, he, it's for your sins. It's for when other people sin against you. It's for death, it's for divorce, it's for anxiety, it's for anything, any pain or hurt or sorrow or heartache. It, he can come and make it better. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. And he did it on that night. And I just stood there in that mirror, all amazed. You know, too many of us humans think that God is this big, mean, scary man on this throne. And he's just looking and he's just wanting us to screw up so he can go, ah! Do you really think Heavenly Father has that ego where he needs to like do something like that or like be right or I told you so? No, oh, he's a loving Heavenly Father and so is his son, Jesus Christ. Parents out there, let me give you a couple of stories, analogies. If your child clumsily spilled milk, would you love them any less? Even if they did it in a rebellious nature, like threw it in their little brother's face and he, you know, to be mean, you wouldn't like that. You might discipline the action, but you wouldn't love your child any less. You still, you, the, it's not based, your love for your child's not based on if they spill milk. Too many of us believe Satan's whispers that when we sin or do something wrong, God doesn't love us. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Let me ask you this. If you're a parent and your kid comes to you and he burned his hand on the stove and you've told him not to do it, what parent doesn't rush over and grab the hand and, and, and with love bring him over to the sink and, and cool it down? I mean, are you the type of parent that instead just watches your, your child suffer with a hurt hand going, well, I told you so. That's not my fault. You deserve that. Because if you are that parent, can you meet me out in the parking lot out back? I'd like to beat you to a bloody pulp. <laughs> so let's stop thinking if we are sinners and we love our children with so much love and it doesn't matter what they do, we still love them, then can we, as the child to a father in heaven, can we at least just see that he, his love isn't based on what we do, it's just we're, we, because we exist and we're his. Here's the deal, I'm just gonna lay it out for you. Jesus loves you, he does. Uh, if he loved only the perfect people, he could only love himself. And yes, he has confidence in himself. He loves himself, right? He knows who he is. But he woke up every day of his life and he looked to love, bless, and serve other people out of love. He loved the, the spiritual and he loved the sex addict. He loved the humble and meek and he even loved the Pharisees and Sadducees who were complete idiots, right? He loved them because he knew who they really were. Jesus has commandments that he wants us to follow, but again, he does that out of love because he wants us to follow his commandments so our lives go better. But when we break those commandments, his love almost 
is more increased. He's like, please come back, right? I mean, even when we break commandments, his love overflows. During the times you don't feel loved or you feel like giving up, will you remember this quote from Jeffrey R. Holland? He says, considering the incomprehensible cost of the crucifixion and the atonement, I promise you, he is not going to turn his back upon us now. From the mocking, the spitting, the pressing a crown of thorns into his skull, the whipping with jagged bones tied to the whip and ripping his flesh off every strike of the whip to make his back look like it had gone through a meat grinder, then throwing a splintered huge railroad tie on his back and th kicking him while he's trying to climb a mountain, stabbing a spear into his side and taking rusty, jagged, huge railroad ties and just crashing him into his bones on his, his, his hands, his wrist and his feet. Then to bring him up and to jolt him into the, the hole that the cross goes into and to, to tear him. He did all that. He bled through every pore in the Garden of the Gethsemane for you and I. Now, I don't know about you, but let's try an experiment. I'm going to tie this cord around my finger. And I'm going to wait. It's already turning red. And we'll see how long it takes, how much pressure is on me to start to bleed, to have the blood have to come out of the pores to avoid that pressure. Okay, I'm not going to do that. It's already hurting, and I'm a wimp. But Jesus Christ, in that Garden of Gethsemane, bled through his pores for us. And even at the cross, even at the cross, Roman soldiers mocking him, he just was like, I love you. I love you guys. If he can forgive the Roman soldiers who literally put holes in him, if he can forgive and love those Jewish leaders who falsely accused him and had him murdered, is there anything you and I could do where he wouldn't love us? So please, strive to live the gospel because it's fun. I love living the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're the best years of my life when I'm on fire with Jesus. And the times I, I put him on the back burner, it's the worst years of my life. So I live the gospel, or at least try, because I'm selfish. I want a good life. So live the gospel, but when you don't, because none of us live it fully all the time, when we sin, love yourself. And do not listen to this old scratch that says, oh, you've done something wrong, or you're not good at this thing, so you're a loser. Because he's lying to you, and your savior would never, ever, ever not love you because of something you've done. When we do something wrong or someone hurts us, that is when we need Jesus the most. The devil will whisper to you and say that you should hide from Jesus. And I know why he does that, because he knows that if you come unto Christ, you will feel his love and be happy. You should never feel shame. If you feel shame, know that's of the devil. The Lord doesn't work that way. He may prick our hearts when we do something wrong so that we can get back on the right path, but he will never shame us. Shame is of the devil. I might look a little like the savior because I have long hair and beard, but it's just a good thing that I wasn't actually called to be the savior, the central figure in our heavenly father's plan in the pre-earth life. Because if I was, we'd all be screwed. Because you see, the first time a Roman soldier hawked a loogie in my face, uh, yeah, I'd introduce the world to mixed martial arts a lot sooner than it originally was. Just saying. But that is why he is my hero. Because he has that love that I envy. I don't know how he can do that, but I'm just glad he did. Because I need his love daily. In the scriptures, he says, For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. You see, he has no side jobs, no distracting hobbies. He wakes up every day looking, how can I love, bless, and serve my children on earth? If you don't believe in the Jesus part of this program, at least believe the parts where I talk about the devil, because he's very real. And in every religion or culture or way of life, there's always a darkness, an abyss, someone, something trying to get you. 
So please, believe that the devil is real and don't fight him alone. Find a higher power. Get a special relationship with your creator, whoever you think that is. If it's Buddha, Allah, Jesus. Heck, I don't care if it's that big tree in the movie Avatar with the floating jellyfish, but find someone that you can fight this darkness with. Find some uplifting friends and talk to them. Don't let little Lucy and those thoughts in your mind stay in your mind because then you're on his ground, his turf, his battlefield, and you have zero teammates talk so you have some support. There's a local rock band that my brothers and I follow called Royal Bliss, right there. I actually bought this hat at one of their concerts. Um, and people ask when I'm wearing this, what does the RB stand for? And I first would go, oh, Royal Bliss, they're a band and stuff. And then one day I just was looking at that going, what does that stand for for me? You know, because the band, that's, hey, it's our band. But for, what does that RB stand for me? And I thought, I'm royally blessed. I know my heritage. I'm redeemed beautifully. And so now when someone asks, hey, what's the RB on your hat stand for? I get into a whole sermon and they're just like, okay, I just, I just wanted to kind of, I didn't even really want to know, really. And I'm like, no, it's Jesus, and then it's great. You're royally, but did you know you're a son of God? And it's great. Uh, <laughs> when the devil came to Moses, how did he address him? He came up to Moses and said, Moses, son of man. Very first seconds he's with Moses. He's trying to separate who Moses is. And he does that to us, too. So please do not be fooled and tricked by the devil into thinking you're anything less than a son or daughter of God. And that is a very special, special thing. I realize I have non-Christians that will be watching this and I just wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for getting this far in this presentation. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I, Jesus to me is not a, a dead statue hanging on a wall in a church. He, he's alive. I, he's, he's really helped me out so many times. And so my challenge to you is let Jesus take the wheel for a little bit. What, what can it hurt? Give him a month or two. Study about who he is and just try to live his life. Pray to him a little bit and just you know, take a test drive with Jesus. And if it doesn't work, what have you, what have you lost? A couple months of what, you know? You can always go back to thinking he's nothing, but I testify he is something. And so, you know, I get it. There's so many hypocritical Christians and it drives me nuts. I, I, I've wanted to punch people in the face so many times. I've had to leave church because I just, the balls, the, the fist balls up, man. And I'm just wanting to just knock someone out. Years ago, when I was growing out my hair, a guy from my own church at church walks up to me and says, when are you going to cut your hair? I'm all, good one. He's like, no, really, when are you going to cut it? <laughs> I was like, oh, come here, I'll show you. <laughs> Luckily, I had Jesus all up in me and I was being good because I just simply, instead of knocking him out, I just walked away pointing at this painting on my church wall of this long-haired hippie. I can't remember this guy's name. Um, uh, oh yeah, Jesus. And I just walked away and I hoped he got the hint. You see, I don't get hypocritical people. But then again, I don't go to church or try to live the gospel because of people. Because a lot of people suck. I go and try to get a personal relationship with me because I love my savior and I want him in my life. And I don't care what the rest of the hypocrites do or say. You see, there were no hypocritical Christians on the ground in my parents' basement. There weren't even family and friends there. And even if my family and friends were there, what could they do to the images Satan was putting in my head? The horror in my heart and the horror feelings in my stomach. They couldn't do anything anyway because they, they're human. So you see, you have to not be offended by the hypocritical Christians and they got their own issues and problems and just get a personal relationship with Jesus because only Jesus was in that basement saving me. 
Well, this has been a blast for me. I just, I love talking about this stuff. I love feeling the, the feelings I get when this stuff's presented, whether I say it or I hear it. Um, so I just wanna thank you for, for watching this. And, and in closing, I just wanna say that, uh, you know, you're awesome. Um, go, go look at your eyeball tonight in the mirror and realize who you are. There's an unlimited universe inside of you. You've got an amazing Father in Heaven. And um, if you ever need help, call out to him, Father, please, even a two word prayer. And you just keep saying that over and over again until he comes. And if he doesn't come, that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It means he knows you can handle it. He, it means he wants you maybe to go through that pain a little longer, a couple more months, whatever, so you can help someone else. If he didn't let me go through this pain, this devotional doesn't happen. I tell this story to a lot of people. Sometimes pain is okay, but if you're at the rope's end, call out, Father, please, and he'll come, he'll come. And if you need an earthly friend, my name's Terry Holker. Look me up on Facebook and let's chat. Before you do something stupid, before you take your life or whatever, let, let's talk, because I love you. And if you're local, we'll go out to eat. You're buying. <laughs> anyway, thank you for coming to this thing or watching it online. Jesus loves you. I love you. And um, I appreciate you. Hold on. <laughs>